Before we read the the passage here, beginning in chapter number two, let me just uh, go back and get us caught up a little bit. It's very important, kind of when you're going through a book, to have an understanding of where you're at and where you've been and where you're going. And uh, Colossians chapter number two, just just a way of review. Paul says to the church at Colossae, "Hey, we've heard, we've heard about your faith, and we've heard about your love." Uh, We've even heard about it from Epaphras. We've heard about uh, the love that you have uh, for us, the love that you have for each other. And he says, we have this one desire. We have this desire that we pray for. And verse number 9, look what it says in chapter number 1. For this cause also, since today we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire. So Paul, what, 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 what could Paul pray and desire for a church? He says, that you might be filled with the knowledge of uh, His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Do you catch that? We, we sometimes try to get the walk before the knowledge. Okay, You can only walk truthfully according to the knowledge. Okay? Other than that, it's simply conformity. Okay? He says, this is what we desire, that you may be filled with the knowledge and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy. So, he's talking, why is he focusing so much on the intellect? Well, the battle that the church at Colossae had and the church at La- Laodicea had was this battle against the Gnostics. The battle against this intellectualism that would try to uh, elevate their thinking to the place where they would minimize the person of Christ. Ultimately, they would not even believe in the deity of Christ. They would come up with this phrase that the Spirit of Christ came on Jesus. Okay, And so when Jesus was born, actually, I'm sorry, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, that's when the Spirit of Christ came upon Jesus and it stayed with Him until the cross and then the Spirit of Christ left, and you too can have the Spirit of Christ. And they would use enticing words. And you can see how if you manipulate it just a little bit, wouldn't you love to have the Spirit of Christ? Okay, But this is taking away the very deity of Christ. It is an attack that comes in the perception, attack that comes at the intellect, and he says, I need you to be filled with all wisdom and understanding. Okay? Then, in order, in case you uh, would listen to those that would minimize the role of the person of Christ, he's going to list out, hey, Christ is preeminent in creation. Christ is preeminent in redemption. Christ is preeminent in your personal life. And Christ is preeminent in the church. And he lists all that out in chapter number 1. And we have gone through that whole process. And here we begin in chapter number 2, where he goes from giving the uh, preparation for the battle and since the 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 um, the the uh, what do we want to call it the strategy for the battle the information that says that we are ready to fight now he's going to personalize it and then he's going to take us into the battle okay you say well what does that have to do with us are we fighting gnostics oh you bet we are okay even inside of those that would consider themselves christian there's a there's a there's a um, an uh, element where we are minimizing Christ and lifting the Spirit. Now, we might call it different names now. Okay? Minimizing the role of Christ and the preeminence of Christ and lifting the Spirit. And we are minimizing the, the authority of Christ in our life. And that is just one step away from not valuing His deity. And I think to myself, what is worse? What is worse in some ways? Not viewing Christ as deity, therefore not giving Him authority. Or viewing Christ as deity and still not giving Him authority. Because That's where it gets personal to us. Oh, I view Christ as deity. He's God, very God. Well, does He have authority in your life? Well, I mean, I give Him control of certain things. What's worse? You know, not viewing Him as authority or viewing Him as the divine authority and not giving Him that knowledge. He continues this idea with the intellect. So let's stand together 
and begin in verse number 1 of chapter number 2 to honor the Word of God. Let's begin reading here, verse number 1. The Bible says this, For I would ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their heart might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches and the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joy and beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ, that as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, that as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, might you give us wisdom and illuminate to us the truth. Lord, help us to not simply grow in knowledge, Lord, but grow in understanding and wisdom and apply it then to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Now, there's a, there's a balance when you, hear, when you hear the Word of God. You ever, ha- ever had sa- somebody say to you, um, I had the knowledge of God's Word in my head, and I didn't have it in my heart? Okay? And I'm going to tell you, I under- I, that's a valid statement. That is a valid statement that some can have the intellectual knowledge but never possess Christ personally. Okay? But let's be careful that we're not misleading. Okay? Because where do you where do you possess your heart? You know, they'll say you missed heaven by 18 inches, right? Technically, when we say Jesus is in my heart. He's not in this organ, is he? Right? He's not there. What makes up my heart? It really, literally is my whole being. It, my, even my, the, very, the very soul that exists in me, the very spirit that now has been made alive. And where is the battle for understanding taking place? And I don't want to minimize the Bible teaching on the heart, Because it's very clear, and it's talking about the the very core of the person. But you know where the front line of the battle is? It's in the mind. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? It goes on to say in verse number 2, that you be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your heart. Actually, it says the renewing of your mind. If I can say this in a right way... I hope my mind gets renewed a lot more than my heart has to. Okay? And so that first battle takes place in the mind, in the intellect, in the will, so to speak. And there comes a place where as a believer, though I want to give him my whole heart, there needs to be a necessity of wisdom, understanding, and acknowledgement. Wisdom, understanding, and acknowledgement. And this is the battlefield that that Paul is preparing them on. In fact, his prayer for them, his one desire for them, was that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That was his prayer for them. Because there are coming attacks. There are coming attacks. And the attacks, to be honest, are going to be tried not so much by the heart, but be tried by the mind. Okay? And when we talk about the Scripture, and the Scripture, ultimately, when we're trying the spirits, we're going to be trying them, how, the, how this Word of God gives us wisdom and understanding in the mind. Now, there is a place for the heart, and there's a place for where I, I love God, and I'm surrendered to God with all my heart, soul, and mind. There's clearly a distinction but when we are dealing with the battle uh, for false doctrine and the battle for uh, false teachers, that battle, first and foremost, is going to be fought in the mind. Okay? It's actually very important because we, by nature, if we're not careful, will not be led by the heart of God. We'll be led by our own heart. 
You ever met, met somebody and you were, you were just drawn to them because they were just so stinking nice? Right? They're nice people. And you, have, you just have a heart for them and you can't help but just like them. But that doesn't mean they're teaching truth. Okay? And so he is going to engage them here in acknowledgement of these things. So look what it says here in verse number 2. Or verse number 1. For I would have you to know the great conflict that I have for you and for them at Laodicea. That's important. In fact, in chapter number 4, it was in the Bible quiz tonight, that he talks about that they also can read the letter that was sent to Laodicea. He wants this letter, though it's going to be read at all the churches, no doubt, he wants this letter to be specifically read at Laodicea. He said, this conflict I see with you and I see with Laodicea. Now, if we were to go to the book of Revelation, we would see where the Laodicean church lost this battle. Did they not? Was, there, was not their perception all wrong? Was, there, was not they were being led by their heart instead of being led by the reality of their condition? In fact, let's go there so we can, so we can understand that. Look what it says in Revelation in chapter number 3. Revelation in chapter number 3. And it says this in beginning in verse number 14. Revelation chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would would thou wert hot or cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. And have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness did not appear, and anoint thine eyes, and I said, that thou mayest see. Now, is he talking about visual sight? This was not a blind church, right? Okay, in a physical sense. Where were they blind? In their mind, in their understanding, in their wisdom. They have been duped, so to speak, to think that they had all they needed and they were all they needed. And he says, buy of me. So who were they leaving out? They were leaving out their riches in Christ. And their glory. And without Christ, what is their true condition? Poor, miserable, naked, wretched. With Christ, they are rich. Now, having that in mind, go back to chapter number 2, and we can see the warning ahead of that, prior to that. Look what it says. Beginning, and he says, Also for them at Laodicea, and, that is, and for as many as not seen my face, and many as he hasn't had a chance to instruct and teach in this area, he says that their hearts might be comforted. Okay? It's a conflict. There are opposing forces that are out there and there are opposing ideas and there are are conflicts that are coming in. He said, I want you to be comforted with this knowledge of the truth. It says, being knit together in love. Now, this is important to understand this. He says, this is a church that has the truth, but it's in conflict. There are those that are bringing uh, opposing teachings and views into the church He says, be comforted, first of all, and be knit together in love. You say, well, that means that they all have to, you know, be nice and warm and fuzzy with each other. Can I tell you, who do you, who are you the most honest with? The people that you love. The people you love the most. Why do you tell your children that you discipline them? Because you enjoy it immensely. No, wait, no. You discipline them because you love them. Right? So this idea of being knit together in love doesn't mean we just all hold hands and sing kumbaya. Is through this love we're able to, to guard each other and help each other to make sure because the conflict, the attack is coming. He says this in verse number 2. Knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Now, you got to just get this, okay? Understand some terminology in the Scripture. You know what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians? That when we know the love of Christ, we can, have, uh, we can know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge. 
Man, what an incredible thing. Okay? To know the love of Christ, you say, well, how does that help me stay online? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ constraineth me. It, it, just like our love would knit us together, as I would be full in understanding and full, uh, it says here in verse number 2, that I would be under the riches of the full assurance of understanding. Well, what are those riches? To the acknowledgement of the mystery. Now, who revealed the mystery? Well, specifically here, the Apostle Paul has revealed the mystery. He reveals the mystery in Ephesians chapter number 3. And he reveals, right here, he reveals this mystery. Well, what mystery would he be talking about? Let's go right back to chapter number 1. And look what it says in verse number 27. To, know, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Even more than just Christ. Christ in you. Okay? Now, catch this. This is important because this is not the Spirit of Christ. This is Christ in you. The hope of glory. He said, just when you have understanding, when you have understanding from the Word of God, now it's not an assurance. It's not in the sense of that I need it to be tested and scientifically proven. It is simply acknowledgement of the mystery. Acknowledgement of what God has already revealed to me. If we would simply live based upon the acknowledgement of what God has already revealed to us, our life would be different. Uh, let me prove it to you. Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Well, Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6. He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. So we acknowledge the mystery that God will do this work in me. If I acknowledge it, what do I have not to rejoice in the Lord for? Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing. You tried that lately? It's not so easy, is it? How do I do that? I, I need to come up with some super experience. No, just acknowledge that He is Lord. And He is Lord of all, and He is Lord of your life. And He is in you. And He wants to work out, as you love Him, He wants to work out things for good in your life. So what anxiety do I have? You ever find it amazing how kids have very little anxiety? Very little anxiety. Try going up to your kids tomorrow and say, are we going to be able to pay our mortgage next month? They're like, sure. We were at, the, we were at uh, Best Buy the other day, and, and I was buying something for the computer, and we get up to the cash register, and Isabella had her little pink purse. And we're at the cash register, and she opened it up, and she took out two pennies, and she's like, here, Dad. <laughs> I'm like, sweet. And I, like, give it to the man. He, he apparently didn't have kids, because he's like, no, I cannot take that. That would be considered a tip. It's two pennies. Take it for my girl. Oblivious. But she was totally engaged. That, that little thing that cost you $39 for your computer, I got that. You know, she had no anxiety over it at all. She would have dumped out her entire little purse of 12 cents and said, have it all, Dad. No anxiety. Why? Because her dependence is completely upon the strength and ability of her parent. Okay? She acknowledges that in her innocency. So if we simply were to acknowledge what we know about Christ, we would live different. And that's what he said. This is this full assurance in verse number 2. Undo all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of what? Of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. He said, here's, here's where your acknowledgement comes. I've revealed to you and even as you've read the Word of God, God's care for you, God's provision for you, God's love for you, God's goal for you, uh, God's ability, uh, God's power. I, he says, I've revealed it to you. And the personal relationship, Ephesians chapter number 3, as they pull the veil away, the personal relationship that God wants with you, that He wants to walk with you 
and you will be his people and he will be your God. And there is a personal relationship. He says, listen, here's what I want you to acknowledge because these other things are coming. Full assurance of understanding. If you acknowledge the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ. Uh, and of Christ. Verse number three, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, imagine putting this together with the church at Laodicea. Obviously, they averted at some point their knowledge of value. Their knowledge of where the riches truly were. Because what did they say? We are rich and in need of nothing. They acknowledge value and earthly treasures that had elevated them to a position that they said, look at us. And they were missing the spiritual understanding. They had, no, they had no full assurance and they weren't acknowledging that truly what came from Christ. That Christ is the one where we find all the treasures and what are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, you say, preacher, are you talking about extra biblical knowledge? No. No, I'm not. Guess where he's revealed all those treasures? But I, I do need the wisdom and the Spirit of God to illuminate to me the truth from God's Word. I need the help. I'm amazed at how many discussions I have with people and they are giving me their arguments or their reasoning or their purpose and they're never using Scripture. Scripture is not paramount in their decision-making process. You're like, where's the Scripture? Well, I just think, you sound very Laodicean. I just think this is the best thing for my family. You sound very Laodicean. Yeah, but but uh, this is going to be this is going to give us things and this is going to help us. <clears throat> you need to acknowledge that the mystery is in God, the Father, and Christ, and that is where you'll get all wisdom and knowledge. Boy, I'm telling you, the Bible gives us access to, to so much. Think about this. The love of Christ that passes knowledge. The peace of God that passes, I'm sorry, beyond knowledge. The peace of God that passes understanding. And they are the treasures that come, that are, are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wouldn't you like to have all treasure, treasures of all wisdom and knowledge? Where does that come from? Just having an understanding and acknowledgement of the mystery of God and Christ, and that mystery is that He is the riches of Christ in you. Well, preacher, doesn't that open up the door for pride? Not if you understand the mystery. Because the glory, the hope of glory, is not your knowledge, but your acknowledgement of Christ in you. That's what it is. That's what makes it. Amazing, because as we see that, and we'll look what it says here in verse number four. It says, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That, that word there for enticing words has the uh, uh, convincing arguments. Very convincing arguments. It's kind of interesting. I was talking about that spirit of Christ. And Paul combats that a little bit. Look what he says in verse number six. We'll come back to verse five. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. You ever wonder why sometimes it's Jesus Christ and sometimes it's Christ Jesus? Okay? The name Jesus really represents Christ's humanity, the one that humbled Himself to become the sacrifice. The name Christ is the fulfillment of the divine and represents that He's been given a name that's been above every name. And here we are for a while, Christ who has come to humble Himself, who will be exalted. And then Paul says, no, 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 lest, lest you minimize the person, this is the Mighty One, Christ, who came to humble Himself. Now, and if that's not enough, he says this in verse number 6, and Christ Jesus, the Lord. Christ Jesus, the Lord. The, the Mighty One, the Exalted One, who came to humble himself, and being humbled himself, he was still very yet the Lord. The Lord himself. To what end? Look what it says in verse number, uh, the, the word Lord has the idea with this. Ownership. Ownership. 
Jesus Christ, the one who humbled himself and was exalted. But now who's coming to you? The exalted one who humbled himself and is the Lord. Paul's saying, you're debating about all this intellectual stuff. About, is he the Christ, or is it the Spirit of Christ, or, or the intellect, or where the riches is? You're forgetting something. He's the owner. <laughs> you're debating over who is in charge. And he is the owner. Wouldn't that be so fun to walk in? Well, let's use Chick-fil-A since Brother John is here. Wouldn't it be fun to walk into Chick-fil-A one day? And seeing, let's see who works there. Mary and Hannah, who both work there, debating over who's the owner of Chick-fil-A. Some great decision. I really think we should start selling burgers now. Uh, and they have this big debate. And Brother John's just kind of standing there going, what? What? They even invoke Brother John's name a couple times. I believe we should do this. And, and I, I'm, sure, I'm sure Brother John will back me on this. He, Brother John steps in and goes, Excuse me, do you realize that your conversation really is of no value? He would probably be nicer than that. Okay? It's of no value. They have no governing ability over Chick-fil-A. They are not the owner. How silly it would be for them to determine direction. Yeah, that yeah, would be silly. You are not the owner. You've been bought with a price. And here's this debate over intellect and riches and value and divinity. And he's like, I just showed you he's preeminent in creation, preeminent in redemption, preeminent in the church. And you're debating all this. This is the exalted one who humbled himself and died. And he is the owner. Now, don't let him walk in you. You walk in him, is what it says in verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Then it gives us this beautiful verse in verse 7 rooted and built up in him. Think about the word rooted. Do you realize some of these beautiful oak trees? We were up in Minnesota. Minnesota has pine trees that are as thick as the oak trees are down here. We saw one. It would take four of us to get around it. If you were going to go hug a tree, it would take a group. Okay? It was a big tree. And doing a little research, I found out, especially when you see like these oak trees, do you know the underground system of the roots is as expansive as the above ground system of the branches? And one of the reasons that sometimes trees so easily fall over is because they either do not have the, the, the resources of the soil or the water or the depth of soil to really be rooted, rooted down and be, grab onto it. And so they grow beyond their root. And a wind comes and blows them down. Like the book of James says, blown about. Okay? They're unstable in all their ways. Like a man tossed to and fro. He says, here, here's why I want you to be rooted. In verse number 7, being rooted and built up in Him. Now, this is so important. If I could try to get this across. As a church, sometimes we are so engaged in, in program and process and these things, and we get people and we plug them in, and they become part of the culture of the church and all of a sudden, they look around and they see everybody's dressing nice, so they start dressing nice. They see everybody, nobody's cussing anymore, uh, so they stop cussing, you know. Their life changes because it's a level of conformity. But if they do not begin to be rooted in Christ personally, diving into the Word and, and letting Christ uh, become real to them and work on them and grow on them, you know what's going to take to blow them over? Just a little wind. And we see that all, and sometimes as churches, we're guilty. And we try to get their growth and visually, exterior, to be beyond their roots. And where our encouragement should be is, listen, you need to be rooted and built up in Christ. But lest you think we should sit back and wait, can you see how he mixes the metaphors here? Rooted, a very agriculture plant type metaphor, built up, a very building architectural uh, type metaphor. While you're being rooted, guess what's happening at the same time? 
you're being built up. Because the other thing we like to do sometimes as Christians is, well, it's just me and God. Just me and God. I don't like to, I don't like to be out there. I don't like to you know, talk to people. I don't like to serve. You know, it's just me and God. Listen, you may be digging into Christ, but He wants you to also be built up. To be a tower. To be some place where a light can be hung. Okay, so to be root, uh, built, uh, rooted and built up and established in the faith. That idea of established is creating some bearings. As I'm being rooted down in Christ, as I'm being built up, guess what keeps me on track? The teachings of the Word of God. You ever met somebody that appeared to have just a wonderful love for the Lord? Really wanted to serve the Lord? And you were amazed at how some of the things they believed were so off from the Bible? I mean, so off from the Bible. And that may work for a time, but can I tell you, this idea of establishment is setting the course. And that might work. You might be, you know, I just love the Lord, and there might be a genuine love for the Lord. And they might be on display for God, okay, being built up. But if they're not established by faith, if they're not established by the parameters in the faith, boy, at best, they're a one-hit wonder. At best, they're a one-hit wonder. I have been amazed. Here's what you need to ask. Now, maybe you don't ask this verbally to them, but observe. Observe. Observe their kids. Observe their kids. Observe their grown kids. Where are they at? Because you might be rooted and built up, but if you are off on your teaching, your direction is not going to be established in the faith. It's very important, Paul says, and not to this intellect. And he says, abounding as you have been taught, as, as you have been instructed, abounding there, therein with thanksgiving. I've been... Sometimes people are drawn away by false doctrine simply because they find the condition of their life miserable. If I can say this in the right way, Lord, help me say this in the right way. The condition of your life, your Bible teaching and your Bible doctrine should not be blamed for the condition of your life. Just shouldn't. In fact, maybe you should go back to the beginning and ask yourself if you're filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I remember meeting people that said, yeah, I believed all that stuff you believe and I just I had somebody that was mean to me and then somebody that believed this was nice to me so I changed and started to believe what they believed. Well, shame on that miserable person that was mean to you. God will judge him. If he was truly mean. God will judge him. But you just got pulled away by somebody with enticing words. In your moment of weakness. Apparently, you weren't rooted enough in Christ. And you got pulled away. Go back up and look what it says in verse number 5. It says this, For though I be absent in flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and steadfast steadfastness of your faith in Christ. You understand what he's saying here? He's not talking about, we talk about, hey, you know, grandparents tell their kids, I I mean, I'll be with you, but I'm with you in spirit. That's not the same thing. Okay? You ever met somebody that was from a different country and different culture that knew Christ as their Savior? And you had something in common just like that? I mean, just like that. You know what you had in common? Christ. Christ. He's literally saying, I'm with you in spirit. I'm with you in spirit. And he says, listen, you're going to be steadfast. You're going to be, I am I'm, I'm joying and beholding your order. Your ability to keep your eyes on Christ. Despite all the cries that would try to get you to deviate. And some of them have really, really good arguments. Really, really intellectual arguments. Enticing arguments. Convincing arguments. 
We have to be careful, make sure our eyes are on Christ, but yet we're still being governed by the faith. We're being governed by the faith. It says there are some of those that are going to be attacking. I see that you can see the Laodicean church and you can see the end result. At some point, the Laodicean church began to believe what everybody was saying about them. They began to believe what everybody was saying about them. And it really wasn't even true. The Ephesian church began to believe what they were saying about themselves. They were really good. And they were really good. The Laodicean church, they had this perception, but it wasn't even true. Because in their mind, they had lost the battle of really understanding the position that they held in Christ. So well, how does that affect us? Let me just give you a couple thoughts and we'll be done. First of all, the spirit of understanding and the spirit of wisdom and knowledge cannot be maintained by a prideful person. Any of you ever struggle with pride? Pride is simply a self-elevation of thought, action, or deed, or person. And as soon as you begin to elevate self, you have forgotten the riches and the hope of glory. Christ in you. Cannot be maintained by that. You ever ever met, met, met a Christian that really viewed it's us against the wicked, wicked world? Man, I can't stand those worldly sinners out there. Oh, they disgust me. Now, can I tell you, in my nature, in my flesh, I could come to that same conclusion. But in the reality, what's the difference between me and them? Christ. I don't care how debaucherous their sin is. What's the difference between me and them? I have the hope of glory. Christ in me. Christ in me. So how do I navigate in this world? I keep getting deeper and deeper into Christ and letting Him build me up. And I allow Him to guide me into all wisdom as I acknowledge His authority, not just over my salvation, but over my life. Let me just ask you this question. When's the last time you prayed about a little thing? Don't we like to pray about big things? And praise the Lord, we should pray about big things. But when's the last time you prayed about a little thing? I was with somebody uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't remember where it was, and we were, we were praying, and they said, uh, I don't know where we were going, I can't remember, but they said, Lord, just help me with my attitude this very next, in this very next meeting. Help me with my attitude. And I thought to myself, that's probably a good idea. Because you know how I went in the meeting? I got this. I got this. I know what I'm going to say. I got this. <clears throat> I need to acknowledge. You say, preacher, do you want me to walk every moment in complete dependency upon Christ? Like, if He wasn't there, I couldn't do anything? You got it. That's it. And our kids need to see it. Our wives need to see it. Our husbands need to see it. And how important it is Boy, if we were to ask the ladies of the church to come up and say what the number one struggle for their husband was, how many of them would say it's pride? We're not going to do that tonight. <clears throat> Man. Well, how do, I, how do I combat that? Why don't you acknowledge it? Why don't you acknowledge? Honey, let's pray because I need the help of Christ. I need to acknowledge the ministry of Christ in my life. The riches. He's preeminent. He's in charge. I'm going to acknowledge it and pray that He gives me spiritual understanding. We in America have a very Laodicean attitude. We got this. We got it down. Uh, Actually, He might say of us, you're poor, wretched, naked, miserable, Why don't you just acknowledge the supremacy of Christ, the exalted one who humbled himself, who is the owner. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we would be obedient to you, Lord, 
in this battle that first takes place in the mind, how we have to surrender, give first place in our life to You. And acknowledge the mystery that is God and the Father and Christ. What a great mystery that Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if Christ is really in me, Lord, help me not to be so arrogant to think I should take a step without You being my Lord. Without acknowledging Your authority. And in fact, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Excited about a life in Christ. And not such easy prey for those that would come with enticing words through elevation of false teaching by implication would minimize the person and the role of Christ in my life. Lord, we saw that the Laodicean church fell to that. We would have to acknowledge that we are very much headed that same direction as we look around in churches and the condition of churches. Lord, we can't change all the churches. We can't even change all the people. But we as individuals and families and one church can acknowledge it's Christ, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Help us to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.